Jesus is through Mary, whether you know it or not, uh, whether you recognize that or not, it's simply the truth. And when I was, right after I had my conversion, I saw a bumper sticker that summed this up really nicely. And I say this all over, so you may have heard this. I don't know where this bumper sticker came from or who made it or if it's, you know, uh, somebody's got multiple copies of them or it's just some individual put it on their car. But it said it perfectly. It said, wise men still find him with his mother. That's, isn't that brilliant? Because it dawned upon me, wow, that sums up the whole to Jesus through Mary thing. Because think about it. When God chose to come into this world to save this world, he chose to come through the Blessed Virgin Mary. Could have come in tons of other ways because he's God, but he chose to come through her. Now imagine if people had gone to that little, you know, stable in Bethlehem and said, busted in there upon the scene after Jesus was born and said, okay, woman, whoever you are, you're insignificant, step aside, we want Jesus. You're of no consequence, please, would you remove yourself from the stable? We've seen the star. No, that's not what happened. If those men who traveled from far away, you know, the wise men, if, if, they, if they come there, they have to receive him from her. They wouldn't just go up and say, please, step aside, give us Jesus. No. If they're going to gaze upon him, how are they going to gaze upon him? Through her. In her arms. That's just how it works. Now we're talking about people of great importance in those days. These guys traveled from far away and they had gold, frankincense, and myrrh and all this, you know, stuff. And yet even they, kings of the earth, so to speak, received Jesus through Mary. It's a key principle, a huge key principle, because just picking up with a little bit of the story from last night of my conversion, when I was becoming Catholic, before I was Catholic, I knew that I had to join the Catholic Church because it made so much sense to me that there was only one church that God founded. Now this may, if you're not Catholic, you may get ticked off for like the next 10 minutes. <laughs> and I'm cool with that. That's what I do. <laughs> See, when I was becoming Catholic, as I said last night, one of the most disappointing things for me were the Catholics that I met. They were dead. They didn't understand the faith. They didn't know what the church taught. They were actually, in most conversations, uh, living in sin, whether it was practicing contraception in their marriage or they were in favor of, you know, uh, abortion on some level, maybe not a radical level, but they would say things like, well, if a woman gets raped, okay, in that instance, she should be able to. And I'm like, mm, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And I heard these things coming from Catholics, people who went to daily mass. I heard this stuff coming from people who went to, were on the parish council, people who were in the choir, people who were extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. And I, I would hear that and I would see tons of other things like on the license plate or on the bumpers of their cars in the parking lot of the church, I would see rainbows. Now, we're not talking about the covenant to Noah, okay? <laughs> Promoting, basically, homosexuality. And I'm like, no, wait a minute. But this is a guy that's in the choir. This is a person who's on the parish council. This is a person teaching RCIA or CCD or uh, in the parochial school. And I'm like, I don't get it. Lord, I know that you founded Catholicism because you're not a God that's up there rolling dice. You, you're, you didn't, you know, send your son into the world and say, okay, I'm going to die and pour out my blood and go through this agony and torture in Gethsemane and through the cross and have chunks of flesh ripped off my body and be in a pool of my own blood and the presence of my own mother is going to watch me get humiliated and killed. And I'm going to found this church, but you know what, 1500 years later, I'm going to have some guys in Germany and Switzerland come along and change it because they don't like it. They don't like this particular book in the Bible, so they'll get rid of it. No, that's not God. God's not up there rolling dice saying, Whoa, you want to build your own church and start your own church and become your own bishop of your own particular church and then you don't like what he's saying? Oh, I'm sorry. Why don't you go start your own? And then you can start your own and you can just be divisive, 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 and you can just wing it. That's not what he intended. 
one church. Why? Because God basically has married humanity and God's not a polygamist. There's only one bridegroom and one bride. Jesus is the bridegroom. The one holy Catholic and apostolic church is the bride. There is no other. And I know that that can sound so arrogant to people and bold, but it's so true. So very true. And what I didn't understand when I was not even Catholic yet, but wanted to become Catholic, I felt like the Lord duped me. I was like, what did you do to me? You revealed the truth to me, found in its fullness in the Catholic Church, but I'm seeing people wounded in this church big time. These people, I got issues and baggage, no doubt. But I didn't grow up with the truth. These are people who were born into Catholicism and they seem to hate it. See, I remembered my youth of me, you know, smacking my mother and as I said before, holding a gun to my mother. And that was bad, obviously. But what I saw now was the spiritual analogy of all of these children of Mother Church basically saying to Mother Church, don't tell me what to do, you stay out of the bedroom. And basically going to their mother and saying, get out of my face, I hate your guts. Remember, just like I had done. But only they were doing it to their spiritual mother, the church. How dare you tell me what to do with my body? Acting like a little teenager, throwing a temper tantrum in matters of morality and so forth. Just like I had done, literally, I saw people doing in the church spiritually. And it freaked me out. I was like, Lord, I know that this is the church that you founded. I mean, it's got the sacraments. And you yourself said in the scriptures, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life. You can't get any clearer than that. You can't get any clearer than Jesus saying to Peter, he who hears you hears me. Hello? So why would I go following some other dude who's got his interpretation of the scriptures? He doesn't know what the heck he's talking about. He's winging it. I don't want somebody winging Christianity. I want somebody who speaks on behalf of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ told him to. You are Peter and rock, and on this church, rock I build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it, and he who hears you hears me. Can't get any clearer than that. And the sacraments are there. He who sins you forgive are forgiven. He who sins you hold or held. I mean, it's, it's there. It's so clear. Catholicism is so there. And yet I, I was confused because I knew I didn't have to look outside of Catholicism for the truth. Catholicism got it all. But I saw the wounds of a lot of the members, me, myself, obviously, too. But I saw, oh, my gosh, everywhere. And you know what I did? I had to, I had to like, go into hibernation, I guess you could say. And I begged Our Lady, Mary, please protect me. Because most of these people that I'm meeting that call themselves Catholic scare me. They don't know their faith. And actually, I'm scared to even be around a lot of them. Because a lot of them are well-educated in the worldly sense. And they would come up with arguments. You know, because I was zealous. You know, I, I would be the kind of kid as a convert that would wait outside of a church and I'd be handing out flyers, you know, against contraception and against all this kind of stuff. And people would look at me like, what are you doing? I was like, what are you doing? This is the truth. Why are you not? I mean, I, I couldn't believe what I was uh, observing. And so I asked Our Lady, please protect me because these people are giving me arguments that sound good, but it doesn't settle right in my soul. Something's not right here. This is not the Jesus that I've come to know. And I'm not so sure that me and a lot of these people are talking about the same Jesus at this point. And I begged her to cloak me with her mantle. Because in the early 90s, I had my conversion in 92, there was a lot of books out there, as there are today, like if you go to Borders or Barnes & Noble, the Christian section is right next to the New Age section and the tarot cards and the whatevers, and a lot of times they get mixed up and, and you pull out books and you'll see books in the Christian section that say things like, the lost gospels. See, because I was curious, I was inquisitive, I wanted to learn as much as I could about Christianity. So I'd go to bookstores and I'd see a book that said, The Lost Gospels. Interesting, fascinating, right? Da Vinci Code type stuff, you know. So you pull it out and you're like, what's this? What? The early church withheld this secret information from us? Those stupid men? And then you start to hate the church. You start to question the church and her authority, and especially men. You start to see it as a male-dominated hierarchical church that oppresses women and makes everybody a victim and just beats everybody up. Hates sex, hates everything. And I'm, I, would, I started reading this stuff and I was like, man, 
I could get duped by reading this stuff because it sounds good, but there's something not right. It's not resonating with me in my soul. And so I begged Our Lady, cloak me, please cloak me and cover me. And I read, you know, I was in those days, like many people were, a huge, huge guy who wanted to be fascinated by the mystical type things. Any apparition, any locution, anything, I would chase it. Now, not all of them are true. Satan can mock and ridicule and make fun of and so forth. Well, I would pick up books and guess what? I would read and I would tell, I would be able to tell because I asked her to cloak me. Mary, cloak me so I don't get deceived. I'd be reading and some person said they were receiving an apparition and what would they be talking about? <coughs> Reincarnation, right? Or uh, they had an apparition of Joseph and Joseph kind of had an attitude and was yelling at him and all. I'm like, what? Like, this is whack. I mean, this is so crazy. I can't believe that people actually are suckered into believing this. This is insane. I can't, they're saying that the Blessed Virgin Mary in this is come, coming to earth and talking about reincarnation. You've got to be kidding me. And yet, these books were all over the place. And I saw there was a lot of books in those days about angels. Angel this, angel that. And I'd, I'd see some of these books, and I'd see the cover with a beautiful angel, like an erotic angel. And I'd be like, that ain't an angel from paradise. That's some dude's fantasy. He's put wings on some beautiful woman. And he's having some fantasy, and he's writing this book as though he's receiving locutions. And I was like, Mary, protect me. Please protect me. And I met people with PhDs and educated from prestigious American universities. And they would offer all of their criticisms to my basically telling them what the church taught on tons of different issues. And they're smart. And I wasn't. All I knew was I love Jesus Christ. This is what the church documents say. That's what it says. I believe it. But so many people didn't want to submit to that kind of stuff because they'd been educated. They didn't need that. And I ran. I went into like hibernation to the point of just praying a lot every day and asking Our Lady, I want to know the real Jesus. I want to know the Jesus that you know because nobody knows Jesus better than you do. And sadly, tragically, I hate to say this, I thought that a lot of times I could even trust the sisters. These ones we could, obviously. But some of the things that the sisters were telling me, these were brides of Jesus, I thought. But many of them and what they were saying, oh my gosh. It was worse than what the lay people were saying. They were waiting for the day because it was an injustice that women couldn't be priests. We had rights and we will overcome this and we will join the, the we are the church or the voice of the faithful until we see this oppression done away with and these men oppressing us. I was like, what? I was like, I don't understand this because do you not know that the greatest creature that ever lived was a woman, Mary? Greatest creature that ever lived was not a man. Jesus is the God man, okay? He has a divine person. Mary is a human person, a creature, not God. The most exalted creature that ever lived. And yet, and yet, she was not a priest. She wasn't fighting for it, she didn't want it. It wasn't what was offered to her, it wasn't her gift. It doesn't mean that men are better than women because the facts are everybody knows we're not. Everybody who has a brain knows that women are better than men. That's not the point. The point is there are roles and functions that Christ gave to his church and we have to surrender to that. We can't change it. So I said to some of them, I said, look, your logic there, claiming that you got a right to the priesthood, this is basically how it works. If, let me just throw this back at you. How about I start hating all women and walk around saying it's an, in, I've been, an injustice has been committed to me as a man because I don't have a womb and can't have babies. Therefore, I hate women and I've got rights, and it's an injustice to me that I've been born this way and I can't bear a child. If I start acting like that, I've lost my mind. Yeah. Why? Because this is a gift. You surrender to the gift as it's given. But see, today we fight the gift. People are fighting their biology. They want to get a sex change. They want to get transgender, multi-gender, multi whatever gender, everything. <laughs> fighting against the gift. We've been given two fundamental gifts. One is your gender, 
what you're born into, male, female, with all of its parts and components. It's a gift, a beautiful gift. If you fight against that, you're actually fighting against God, the giver of the gift. Secondly, you've been given the gift of divine revelation. Okay? And if you fight against that, it's not some male-dominated church hierarchy with the, you know, that you're fighting against. It's God that you're fighting against. But see, a lot of the modern people wouldn't think that. They would say, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. I know exactly what I'm talking about. Because there's that ancient battle between the woman and the dragon. The woman being at the center of history, the bookends of history, and Satan hating her. And knowing that if you want to get to the man, the head of the human family and of each particular individual family. See, most modern people wouldn't even like that I just said that. But it's true. If you want to get to him, the best way to do it is through her. What you want to do, what Satan wants to do, fallen angel, extremely intelligent, wants to get Adam, but what's he do? Put Eve right in the middle. Put the sword first through her, first through her, and then to him. It's how it works. Because if women fall, we all fall. Because you women are the heart of the mystery of creation and Christianity. And Satan knows this. You're at the heart of it. Woman is the heart of the home? You betcha. Absolutely. When I was asking Our Lady to cloak me, to cover me, to protect me, and I went into that kind of hiding, she did. She gave me an ability to just read the good stuff by like St. Maximilian Kolbe, St. Louis de Montfort, and all these phenomenal saints protecting me. Went into the devotions. And so I could almost sniff out That doesn't sound right. Doesn't have a good feel to it. Where's the tabernacle in this church? Where are the pews? Where are the images? Hmm. Wonder what Father is thinking. Wonder where Father went to seminary. Wonder what these sisters are doing. Hmm. One's a Reiki master. One's a practitioner of all kind of funky, you know, chi this, chi that. What's up? Something happened. And I found myself in this mystery of becoming Catholic and fearing that if I become Catholic, people are going to hate me. Because the only people that I really met at where I was that were really living the Catholic faith were those Filipino women. <laughs> zealous, beyond zealous. And it was tough for me. I didn't have anybody my age. Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> to talk to about this. Not one single person. All my friends from the past abandoned me and I couldn't find any people my age to be able to pray a rosary with or talk about the saints with or, you know, do non-sinful stuff with. Nobody. I was on my own and that was extremely tough. And so I, I entered into the RCIA program, right? Because my, remember my baptism was valid. I baptized the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Episcopal Church when I was 10. So I was going to become Catholic through that process. I had to drop out of the program. Because people in the program were pushing their own agenda. They were talking about women priests. And they were talking about homosexuality is fine. It's not unnatural, whatever. You know, we've all got to find our orientation in life. This, that, and the other. Do whatever you want to do. And I kept saying to myself, you guys don't understand the gift that Catholicism is. Why are you fighting this? I had to drop out of the program. And I said to some of them, I said, look... Do you agree to, with me that one plus one equals two? Or can, we, can we acknowledge that? And they would say, well, yes. And I'd said, well, then why, why can we acknowledge that? I said, did you create mathematics? Did you come up with this? No. Right. So it was around before you were, and it's going to be here after you're gone, correct? Yes. Well, it's the same thing with divine revelation. It's not dependent upon some group that's going to change the truth. Abortion is always going to be wrong. Contraception is always going to be wrong. Homosexuality acts are always going to be unnatural. That's just the facts. I can't change that. And neither can you. It's more real than mathematics, which you just acknowledged that you didn't create and you can't tweak, nuance, dork around with. It's outside of you and me. It's objective. One plus one equals two, always. For 
3,000 years ago, now, and for 3,000 years down the road. That's just how it works. It's the same thing with moral truth that the Catholic Church is the protector of. Because I actually met people that said, and this broke my heart, they said, oh, you know that Polish Pope, I can't wait till that guy just dies. And so we can get another one who will come in and update with the times and get us back to what we really need and want and to get away from this antiquated, outdated church so that more people would feel welcome to come to church if we just start saying contraception's okay. It's, it's okay to act this way and to do this. It's fine. In the past, we're so sorry that, that it, you were told that this was wrong. I heard people say that. See, for me, that's when I came this close to taking the gloves off and just punching some people. Okay, I'm a man. And if you attack my bride, the church, <laughs> you better watch out. Because I'm a man. And any man who doesn't defend his bride when she's being attacked is not a man. And I sadly saw a lot of men, and I, I, I don't enjoy saying this, who didn't do that who wore one of these sometimes, but didn't do that. Wolves were devouring their sheep, or more intimately, their bride, but they didn't call them out. They didn't point out the wolves. Look, there's a wolf, there's a wolf, watch out, they're coming to devour you. Mm -mm. I hardly ever in my conversion process heard at a mass from a pulpit truth. I heard about a golf game and I heard about a fishing thing and somebody movie they saw and a dog. But truth, hardly heard it. That was rough, real rough for me. And so I went into that hibernation asking Our Lady to protect me and she did. Oh my goodness, did she. And she led me into such an intimacy with Jesus that it was the honeymoon. It was just something spectacular. But then, after I became Catholic and realized, you know, what God had brought me into, just a spiritual battlefield, uh, not just outside the church, but inside the church, um, that I just needed to trust. I needed to believe that Jesus was in control, complete control of his church, and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it because he said so. And he gave me all kind of analogies to understand it. And he, one of them was this, and to this day, this helps me so much when I see crazy things going on and hear crazy things and whatnot. I asked Jesus and Mary, Mary, help me to understand this nonsense that I'm seeing all over the place. And in my heart, I understood it this way. The church is God's field, okay? He's the farmer, so to speak. This is scriptural. What does a farmer put on his field to make it grow? Manure, that's the word, manure, <laughs> right? Stinks, nasty, it's foul, disgusting. But that's the wisdom of the farmer. You gotta put manure on the field, sometimes thick. And a lot of people might freak out. They may be like, what in the world? That's disgusting, I'm out of here. And they might leave because see, they don't pray and they don't understand the wisdom of what he's doing. That's what he's doing right now in the church. The manure is thick. It stinks in a lot of places, but you got to trust. He knows what he's doing. Just like you, you, if you have a rose bush, you know, you got to prune it and make it so ugly and unattractive for a period of time. But in its time, boom, gloriously beautiful, abundance of just beauty. It's the same thing in the church right now. We just have to trust. That's why the, basically one of the key messages of our times is what? Jesus, I trust in you. Despite what I see and perceive and the things I hear in the media and sinful things, criminal things done by clergy and this, that, and the other, I trust you. I'm not jumping ship because this is your church. You're in control of it. And even if, even if, and I actually said this to some of the, 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 the sisters that said to me that they wanted a new pope who would change things. You know what I said to them? Because they were saying, we want a liberal pope. We want someone who will come in and, and change all this stuff. I prayed the same prayer with them. Yes, Lord, give us a liberal pope, a deaf, dumb, blind idiot of a pope 
Please, please, Lord. Because these people are going to be so shocked when nothing changes. Literally, the Cardinals could elect a deaf, dumb, blind idiot to become the next Pope. And nothing will change. Because it's not a human institution. It's a divine institution. It's the mystical body of Christ. People could elect a man known to be extremely immoral in his behavior to become the next Pope. Guess what? I guarantee you what would happen. He'll be a sinner, just like we all are. He's, he doesn't become a saint automatically by becoming a Pope. Mm -mm. But in matters of faith and morals, dogmatically, I guarantee you that man would not say something wrong. Why? Because Jesus said so. He who hears you hears me. It's as simple as that. Why? Because God loves you. He doesn't want you guessing about Christianity. He doesn't want you making it up. Because you got a lot of people, right, talking about the Bible, Bible only, you know, just in the scriptures. Got to be in the book. Really? Well, where's abortion in the Bible? It's not in there. So what would Jesus do? He'd do what Peter told you. He who hears you hears me. Tons of issues that are not in the Bible. So what do you say, Pastor John? What do you say, Pastor Bill? You contradict this guy? You... What? You go with what Jesus said. See, Mary brought me into that understanding. My relationship with Mary brought me to live within the heart of the church. Because if you don't, the wolves are going to get you and they're going to rip you apart. They're going to devour you and your family. They're out there so fierce right now, panting. And like St. Peter says in the New Testament, the devil is like a roaring lion going around looking to devour souls. But so many people, they don't understand this. But if you get into a relationship with the Blessed Virgin Mary, you will be driven into the heart of the church so that you begin to change your life. You begin to go to the sacraments. You begin to go to frequent confession. You begin to have a devotional life. You want to spend time with the Blessed Sacrament. You want to go to Mass, maybe even just more than on a Sunday. You want to go deep with our Lord because Our Lady will draw you into this relationship. That's what she does. That's why God's sending her right now all over the earth in weeping images and icons to wake us up, to give us that shock image so that we're whoa, wait a minute, and we have the scales removed, and then we come back to God through her, because that's how it, that's how it works. I'll put it this way, and I'm, I wish I could claim that this was my own thought. It's not. It's Fulton Sheen. That guy was phenomenal. We could use a, quite a few Fulton Sheens today. If you want to read a really good book, by the way, read The World's First Love by Fulton Sheen. Oh my gosh, what a book. One of the best books on the Blessed Virgin Mary ever. He said this, he said, imagine that you're God, okay? You've got all power, you can do anything. And you're going to send your son into the world to redeem fallen humanity. And you're going to, with your son, create this masterpiece. You're going to create your own mother. The second person of the Blessed Trinity coming into the world is going to create his own mother. See, we don't do that. No, no son comes before his mother. But in this situation, God coming into the world, he does, and he creates his own mother. Now imagine that you're God and you're going to do this. Would you make your own mother with any flaws? You're God. Would you make her have any imperfections? I wouldn't. If I were God, my mom would be the most lovely, most tender, most delicate, most feminine, most beautiful, most, 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 most of everything. And all people would call her blessed, and all angels would serve her, and I myself would love her and honor her and obey. See, the God who made the commandments, honor thy father and thy mother, is the God who in time, after having given them first, comes into the world, and then himself obeys it. That's the importance of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And see, because God is not stingy, he created his own mother coming into the world, and then he didn't say, you know, she's all mine, all mine. 
he shares her with us. Behold your mother, our spiritual mother in the order of grace, Our Lady. And as a mother, what is she supposed to do for us? Feed us, educate us, protect us, and correct us. So this is why we refer to the church also as Mater Ecclesia, Mother Church. She's got a right to do all these things and to correct us. Imagine a mother, a mother saying, seeing the child playing in the street or even with wolves and doesn't do anything. Mm, whatever. You've got rights. It's your freedom. You can do what you want to do. Go play on the street. It's okay. No. A mother who sees danger warns the ch children, tells them about it. When the times in which we live, heaven is sending Our Lady to the earth with messages warning us, telling us to do this. You've got to pray. You've got to fast. You've got to do penance. You've got to go to the sacraments. And you can hear her heart, as in like La Salette, and you, you can almost see her weeping because we're not listening. What mother would not cry if she said, baby, don't touch the pot. Can't you, the oven is hot. Okay, I've told you, don't do that. You're going to get burned. But the kid just keeps doing it. Whatever. Basically, that's what we're saying to Our Lady today, and by extension, to the church, our mother. Whatever. See, I saw this so well. Becoming Catholic, and then when I became Catholic, because that's exactly what I used to say to my mother. Remember my whatever. But now so many children of the church are saying that to the church. Whatever. Get out of my face. Who do you think you are? God's love for you. God's gift to you of Catholicism. I am absolutely convinced, as were the saints, and trust me, I'm not a saint, but I'm absolutely convinced that Catholicism has the fullness of truth and it alone is what Jesus Christ intended and it alone is what is going to save the world. Because only the truth will save the world in its fullness. Remember, this is clear in the scriptures too. When Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life. And what happened? Remember John chapter 6? People walked away. They did. They, they started discussing among themselves, this man basically is crazy. How can we eat his flesh and drink his blood? They were probably making gestures, which we can't read in the scriptures, like, crazy. This guy needs help. And what did Jesus say when they walked away? He didn't say, wait, I'm sorry, did I offend you? We're the diversified, tolerant people here. Let's come back, group hug, small group s'mores, and let's affirm each other. <laughs> you? He let them walk away. Because he doesn't love them, Jesus is mean and nasty. No, because he does love them. Truth can't change. Truth will remain a steadfast anchor to the soul, even though we go away from it for a time. Every soul will struggle with the truth. It's just like fishing. You, you never catch a fish with a dull hook. And anybody who fishes knows as soon as you feel that bite, you set it. The fish will exhaust itself. It'll go under the boat. It'll go way out. But see, God's the divine fisherman. He's got lots of slack. You can run. You can exhaust yourself. But you can't get away from it. Truth is magnetic to the soul. We don't have a choice to be, but to be drawn to it. We may fight and resist. That's, we're sinners. Just like, you know, uh, Pontius Pilate or Herod. Some way drawn to it. And yet, stuck in sin and living a life that is not, they got to die to themselves. Well, so much of that is happening today amongst so many Catholics that they're so fighting and so resisting. But I, I, I want to say this, because I think you need to hear it. You know all those prayers that you've been praying for? Priests, many people. Lord, send us priests. Please send us priests. Marian priest, Eucharistic priest, priest, men who love the church. God is answering those prayers. It's just a matter of time. See, the manure, I believe, is being reduced now. And that new springtime that John Paul II talked about, now Pope Benedict is 
you know, talking about, it's coming. How it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, I have no idea. But it's going to happen. The bush has been pruned. And now we're going to start to see some amazing fruit. Some amazing fruit. You won't read about this in the newspapers. You won't see this on CNN. You won't hear about it. They'll keep up all the stuff that they do against the church. So will Hollywood and so forth. But it'll be happening secretly, in quiet. God is doing amazing things in our time. And he's doing it primarily because he himself has sent the Blessed Virgin Mary, yet again, to convert souls and to bring souls back to him. It's so easy to see this. I meet people all over the place that talk about this, and they get, but they get ridiculed because they had a huge conversion through an apparition, many of which is Medjugorje, and you talk to them, but sometimes they can't be loud about it or they'll get in trouble. But it's everywhere, all over the place. I talk to a lot of guys, I'm the vocation for our community, and I ask them, what brought about your discernment to become a priest or a religious? And they'll say usually one of three things, more or less. It was a Marian apparition, a Eucharistic miracle, or reading a book about a Eucharistic miracles or something like that, or it was JP2 or Pope Benedict, something to that effect. And most of the guys, most, not all, but most of the guys in the seminaries today were not model Catholics growing up. They either left the church, went to college, which, you know, basically educates people to become dumb. <laughs> really. Poisons them. And, or... They dabbled in other religions or this, that, and the other. They saw college as the way to their freedom to get away from mom and dad. No, they don't have to go to church. They can do whatever they want to do. But then they got rocked by God, divine two by four, and they answered the call. I don't have percentages or anything like that, but I would say that's probably about 80, 85% of the men in the seminaries today. No joke. They may not be like I was, long hair freak, you know, but they dabbled around. They didn't, weren't always faithful, but now God's got them back. Same thing with the sisters. You look at the sisters' communities who are flourishing. Why are they flourishing? Because they love Our Lady. They pattern their femininity off of Our Lady. They want to they be brides and princesses, and so they wear the beautiful habit. It's so easy to see. It's such a no-brainer how to get vocations. That's why in our community right now we have 26 seminarians. I don't have to put up billboards alongside of a highway. I don't have to go out and come up with little committee meetings to figure out how to do this. Just live a holy life. Live a holy life and be faithful sons and daughters of the church. Show your public devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary through praying the rosary together in common, through wearing a scapular, through having miraculous medals, through just being comfortable talking about Our Lady. Love the Eucharist. Spend time with the Blessed Sacrament. Love and support the Holy Father. Vocation work, to me, is a total no-brainer. Really. In, in my role as a vocation director right now, I basically hardly have a budget at all to do vocation work. I don't put ads in anything. Nothing. I just go out and say to guys, we're looking for good men who are willing to lay down their lives as soldiers on the battlefield, knights of Our Lady, willing to defend what's good, true, and beautiful. You want to come to boot camp? You want to become a man? Is God calling you to this? There's a beauty that's being attacked, souls. Are you going to step up to the challenge, brother? And are you going to fight off that dragon? Men love to hear it in that kind of way. When they come to my house, I pull out this huge sword from my wall, and I talk to them about movies like Braveheart, We Were Soldiers, all those kind of movies, manly movies, butt-kicking movies. So they can understand, you're not, just, you're not just being called to do some secretarial job. Brother, you're entering into battle. You're going to go through your boot camp, and then you're going to be commissioned to go out there and go to war. And when you go to that war, brother, you better remember this. No man goes to war to fight for an institution. Men only go to war because their beauty in their life is being threatened or attacked. 
See, this is why men in the foxholes and the trenches, when they're down, and, you know, and you got Joe next to you and bullets are flying over your head, no man goes into his wallet and pulls out a picture of Walmart. <laughs> hey, Bill, can't wait to get back and go shopping at Walmart, man. This is, this is why we're here, and this is why our buddies have all sacrificed their lives. Mm -hmm. They pull out a picture of what, or rather who? Their beauty. Whatever that beauty may be, whether it's their wife, their mother, their children, you are worth my life. And I'll be willing to take a bullet for you. I'll be willing to lay down my life for you. I love you. Put it back and you run into that battle. That's what a priest does. That's why if a priest doesn't have the Blessed Virgin Mary in his life, he's gonna be in huge trouble. And I almost guarantee you that on some level, he's gonna be a defector. I'm not making this up. In the 60s and 70s, you know this better than I do, looking at some of your ages, right? I'm not putting, just saying. You deny this? You have to be a fool to deny it. You're old, most of you are older than I am. I didn't grow up in the 60s, 70s times. I was born in 72. I didn't grow up in the decadent decade of 65 to 75, when literally in this country alone, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of men left the priesthood. This is a fact, I'm not making this up. I didn't grow up in that time when so many sisters ripped off the veil, left, became new age gurus, Reiki practitioners, and basically, for many instances, the Catholic education system got destroyed, healthcare system, Catholic healthcare system got destroyed. Many of you lived through that. How did that all come about? One of the key factors is, the key piece was taken out of the game. Just like the game of chess, everybody knows the game of chess is about the king. Anybody who doesn't say that is a fool. But who has the most mobility on the board? The queen. And everybody knows if you want to defeat the opponent, you got to get the queen. So, what happened in the 60s and 70s? Marian devotion, gone. You get those statues out of the seminary. We don't pray rosaries in the seminary anymore. We don't pray rosaries in the convent anymore. We don't even want to look like her. Get that veil off of me. I am woman, hear me roar, right? Sure. And when the model, the prototype and the blueprint of what it means to be a Christian and what it means to pattern your life off of in response to God's love and invitation, the fiat, when the fiat is taken away, you gotta replace that with something. And so Our Lady was replaced by tons of other things. In seminaries, when she was taken out and no more devotions, no more votive masses, rosaries in public and all that, men are going to be men. Men have affections. So what happened? Well, you know what happened. I won't go into great detail. But many of the seminaries became pink palaces. You know what I mean. Sadly, tragically. We're still reaping the fruit of that today. I meet so many priests, probably age 55 and up, or thereabouts, they don't have a relationship with the Blessed Virgin. It's her feast day, they don't even preach about her. They're so uncomfortable talking about her, it's like they don't even know her. Not all of them, obviously, by no means. There's some holy priests out there, very holy priests. But wow, see the devil, Satan, Lucifer, is so smart. If you wanna to get to the head, you wanna to get to the man, the woman, attack the woman. If women fall, we all fall. That's why Satan hates Our Lady. And that's why he's seeking to destroy you and me, her progeny, her spiritual fruit. We are spiritual children of Mary. That's why in Revelation chapter 12, he knows he can't get at her, but her other children. Does Mary have other children? Spiritually, yes. Physically, no. We are her children. Satan is seeking to devour you and your families and your parish and your diocese. Satan hates her. The last thing that Satan wants is for you to become holy, without blemish, spot, or wrinkle, and immaculate, without sin. Because the very essence of Christianity basically is this, that you get incorporated into the sonship of Jesus Christ, affiliated into that relationship, and can cry out, Abba, Father. But see, nobody's born again unless there's a woman involved. 
once again, it all goes back to Mary and the church. Without Mary and the church, you ain't going to be able to do it, whether you know it or not. So all the people who say they've been born again, amen, brother. But you didn't know this, but you've been born, spiritually reborn, through the heart of Mary, which is the womb of the church. We even call the baptismal font the womb of the church. But see, we couldn't have that if we didn't first have the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the mother of the church. Mary's role in our spiritual lives is so crucial, is so pivotal, is so key, that this is why Satan attacks it. This is why the media attacks it. This is why nowadays, you know, even in those stupid cartoons, South Park, whatever it is, and all, they mock Our Lady. They make fun of Our Lady. People don't just say God's name in vain anymore. They say Our Lady's name in vain. I've heard it. Because Satan hates her. And Satan knows what she's doing and bringing souls back to Jesus, and he wants to destroy it and get rid of it. But what do the saints tell us? The saints tell us basically that every soul is meant to become an altar of Maria for Jesus. Another Mary for Jesus. Because you're never going to outdo her. No Pope, angel, nobody, no matter how holy, is ever going to outdo Our Lady. St. Louis de Montfort says in his total consecration that the role of the Christian is to become liquefied and be poured into the Mary mold. Mary's not a cookie cutter, but it's a really good way of understanding it. This is why in days of old, you know, religious would take the name Sister Joseph Mary, Sister Alexander Mary, Sister whatever. Mary's the pattern. Not just for sisters and priests, for everyone. Everyone. You included. So the question is, what's your relationship like with her? Have you placed yourself and your family under her maternal protection and guidance, giving her the ability to nourish, educate, protect, and correct you? You need to do this, and you need to do it now. Because without this, you run a great danger of possibly even following a different Jesus. Because there's tons of Jesus being presented out there today. And you could even find yourself saying, well, though I'm an extraordinary minister of communion at my church, you know, when it comes to voting, uh, I see this issue. The, why is everybody always talking about abortion, abortion, abortion? This issue, for me, is the pivotal one. It's not about you. It's about the truth. Truth will change everything. Remember Jesus said, when I am lifted up on the cross, I will draw all men to myself. Truth has to be crucified. Are you willing to be crucified? Are you willing to die to yourself? Jesus could have said, you know, I'll just gather everybody around and tell them what they want to hear and tickle their ears and make everybody feel good. That ain't going to save anybody. Truth saves, even though it slaps you across the face, and it will. It'll knock you out. And that's a good thing. That's a great thing. Let it knock you out. And let Our Lady be the one to pick up those pieces and to put you back together and to make you what you were created to be, fully alive, because you've surrendered to the truth. The truth as only taught, guaranteed 100%, I would give my life for this. The truth is only taught in its fullness in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. All the other ones are the inventions of men. Sounds arrogant, I know. And you probably maybe have never even heard that from a Catholic priest. But I have to say it. Not putting anybody down, but it makes me so upset when all these Catholics are leaving Catholicism and joining all these other churches. Why? Because the music's better? Because the preaching is more dynamic? What? What's up? I'll tell you why. It's because you don't have to change your life. You don't have to change your habits. Things that the Catholic Church calls out wolves. That's a sin, and it will not lead to your happiness. And as your mother, I'm telling you this because I love you. Baby, you can play in the playground. Here, play. This is your freedom. But if you play outside, the wolves are going to get you. The only way that you're going to know this and be able to persevere through this in these times is if you have a relationship with the Blessed Virgin Mary. If you don't, I almost guarantee you, you're going to get some funky thinking going on. You're going to get some strange ideas going on. 
and you will begin to fall. How do I say this with conviction? Because I know. I've been a priest for seven years. As I said, I'm no saint. I make mistakes, I do stupid things, I say and do stupid things, and I go to confession a lot. And when I'm not where I should be, with praying my rosary, talking to our lady, spending time with her, you bet. Old Stinky gets his foot in there, before you know it, I could find myself thinking, wanting to do bad things. But when I stay close to Our Lady, there is this maternal protection. Doesn't mean it's easy. Go through the trial, and I mean, sometimes I think I'm gonna sweat blood, trying to go through the agony of the torture of dying to myself. It's tough. Only with Our Lady. Only with Our Lady. De Maria Num Quam Satis. Of Mary, never enough. You can never have enough of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Her whole role is to lead you to Jesus Christ. Do it. Yourself, and for your children, and for your family. There's almost nothing greater that you could do in the times in which we live right now than to give yourself entirely to her. And to keep doing it. I give you everything. We have lived in the times of one of, and now we're blessed with Pope Benedict, who's phenomenal. John Paul II was basically, in my opinion, the third greatest man to walk the earth. Jesus, St. Joseph, and then John Paul II. That's my opinion. <laughs> this guy told us, told us to us, O oh Maria, I'm all yours. He gave us this model to live by. And now Pope Benedict is just awesome, phenomenal, phenomenal. You know what blessed times it is right now to be a Catholic? Our Lady is everywhere. Divine mercy is saturating the earth for you, broke, wounded, because God is your Father and He knows that. And we live in a time of phenomenal popes, phenomenal popes. Love your faith, live your faith. And as I said yesterday, I'll say it again today, I'll, I'll end with this. Pray for me, please pray for me. And pray for the seminarians in the seminaries right now, because it's not easy, trust me. Many of them get labeled, you know, they're homophobic. They're, you know, rigid, traditionalist. No, they're orthodox. They want the truth. Pray for them that they can persevere and that they can become a new generation, a battle breed of men of God who will be willing to go to war for you and your family, spiritual warfare. For you, we need holy priests. We need good men now to take up this challenge. Pray for them, pray for them, pray for them. And I will pray for you because I know it's not easy. I know in your particular situations, even more people have talked to me today, you guys are going through a lot. I feel for you. So many of you have come up to me and you just bawl. You just start crying because of such a situation in your family and the wounds that are present. I know, man, I know. The wolves have ravaged souls. What is your response? Mary, take me, cloak me, cover me, protect me, shield me, guard me. I will take up your rosary and I will pray it. And I challenge you who, who are spouses here, one of the best things that you can do in your marriage Going to Mass? Yes, you betcha. That's the source and summit. That's the apex of it all. You bet. But sometimes you can just go to Mass and you don't really have to be too involved. I challenge you as spouses to pray your rosary together. I guarantee you that if you've got some issues going on, if you have the humility to pray a rosary with your spouse, by the end of that rosary, you're probably going to turn to your spouse and say, Honey, I'm sorry. That was stupid. I can't believe I said that to you. I'm sorry. See, John Paul II said in his letter on the rosary that only people who pray together can look each other in the eye. Because if you don't pray with someone else, you're, even your spouse, the question is, do you really know them? See, when you pray, you're basically becoming spiritually naked in front of others and saying, you know what? I'm not God. 
I don't have it all together. I need to get my, down on my knees and ask for redemption and healing and forgiveness. And I need to do this in, the pres in your presence. I'm wounded. Be merciful to me. Spouses do that? Oh my gosh. Now, do you have any idea what this has the power to do if a father prays this and his son and his daughter see it? Let me tell you. That little princess sees daddy praying this rosary, a man of devotion. That girl will not grow up to be some little skank, to be a girl who's seeking the affirmation of boys and dressing poorly, because daddy will give that affirmation and will give that good example. And if, and if a little girl sees her father saying, my sweetheart, let's go to church. Today's Sunday, get dressed up, put that pretty dress on, my little princess. Daddy wants to see you with that pretty dress. And, if, and if, if the girl sees that dad saying, look at your mother today, baby. Look at her. Look at how beautiful she is. That's the woman I love, that I married, that I would give my life for, that I worked for. I love your mother. I'm so in love with your mother. That little girl hears that growing up. She's not going to need the affirmation of boys to, and, 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 and therefore strive to get it by basically doing anything that the boys want her to do just so that they can tell her that she's pretty because girls will do that. Almost every girl I meet nowadays is, suffers from so much insecurity, it's insane. Almost every single woman I meet is so insecure because they had a horrible relationship or they weren't affirmed and told they were beautiful and lovely and a little princess by their dad. This is just the facts. Imagine if a little boy sees his dad, that same dad who can go out and go violent on a, on a, on a, on a tree with an ax and can go out and dig holes and drive trucks. If that, if that little boy can see his dad do all that huge, manly, powerful stuff and then take those same arms and go up to his mother and caress her and tell her in the presence of his son, I love your mother. Son, you should, when you grow up, you should try and find a woman just like your mom because this is a beautiful woman. I love this woman. You watch what that boy does. And if he sees his dad praying one of these with his mother or by himself, the example that is given, phenomenal example. Sad thing is today, guys think, I don't need that. That's a crutch. Only weak people pray the rosary. Men pray the rosary. So that's what we need. As a new generation of men across the board praying the rosary, especially priests especially priests. So pray for that. We need, all of us, myself first, more conversion. It's not a one-time event. My big conversion happened in 1992. But see, after about five years, the honeymoon was over. And all the sweetness and sugar of the relationship was taken away. Because that's how a marriage works. You're not going to be on a honeymoon forever. And then you have to get on with the reality of the marriage and the tough things and the doing the will of the other. You know this, you who are married. This applies even to our relationship with God. We're not always going to feel good. We're not always going to feel great going to Mass. Trust me, I'm a priest. There are many times when I'm like, oh man, I got to say Mass. I hate to say that. I'm no Padre Pio. It's a special gift. It's tough. Sometimes I don't pray my rosary and I'm, I'm 10 p.m. I'm like, oh man, come on. That's the crucible. Am I gonna do it? Am I gonna persevere? Or am I at least gonna make an attempt? So many opportunities you're gonna be given to be able to give and do this every day. And Our Lady will give you the strength and encouragement to be able to do it. It's not easy, I know, I know it's not easy. But remember what I said yesterday. You're here to become a child of God. And you're not going to be reborn unless you're born through her. She will bring it about. That birthing process. So that you can become fully alive in Jesus Christ. So, remember that in your families and for the people that you're praying for. Our Lady needs you. And she's asking you to pray, to do penance, to fast, and to be faithful. That's all she's asking. And when we make mistakes, don't panic. Go to confession. 
God's put an endless ocean of mercy there for us because he knows we're stupid. <laughs> it doesn't surprise him or shock him. He knows he's Father God. So turn to him with all your heart and turn to Our Lady. And if you want to stand, I'll give you a priestly blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for sending your divine Son, our Savior, our